So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how my life was forever changed by a few hundred women from thousands of miles away that I don't speak the same language as, we don't share the same religion, we don't share the same culture, but they forever impacted me. So I'm going to fast forward, or rewind uh, to right after I graduated college. And after college, I knew that I wanted to do two things, and one of them was to travel the world, and the other was to help people. I had no idea what either of those meant. The definition was completely ambiguous. So I had a, a really odd opportunity come uh, where I was able to fly and work as a chef, stewardess, uh, assistant on a private jet. So I moved across country and I landed in Miami and I flew probably about 250 days a year out of the country for five years and my days and nights were spent on a beautiful jet. I was staying in gorgeous, expensive hotels. And this is what my life looked like. <laughs> now you laugh, but I'm embarrassed by this. I look at this and it's absolutely obnoxious. <laughs> this is, to me, the definition of excess, and it's not real. This was not my life. We were going to beautiful countries, but also war-torn countries. We were going to places like Jordan, and we were going to Libya, and I was drawn to the locals, and I was drawn to the cab driver, and to the, the woman that owned the bakery on the corner, and I was fascinated by them, but I was being protected in fancy hotel lobbies while the boss drank fancy wine, and I had a bodyguard go with me everywhere. So I realized after about five years of living out of this suitcase that I was piggybacking. This is not my life, this isn't real. So I gotta make a change. And it was scary and it was hard and my friends thought I was insane to leave, but I did. I moved back across country here to Phoenix and I started working for the number one international business school in the world. And I was hired to manage the business training programs for women entrepreneurs coming from emerging economies. What a change this was. This was a life-changing decision that um, I found myself sitting in a classroom with Pakistani women. And I was taken aback by how beautiful they were and their colored scarves and their beautiful black hair. And they were so smart, but they were also very quiet. And I didn't really understand why because I was new at this, but the thing that I didn't realize was the reason they were so quiet was because the most wanted terrorist in the world had just been killed in their country a day before. So they were terrified. This was the most terrifying moment for them as they watched in America as people danced over a death. And so I decided that I was being a hypocrite if I didn't step outside of my comfort zone and treat them like a human, because that's the only thing that was gonna overcome this terrible situation and this emotion of, of being afraid. They were all there for a reason. They owned businesses. They were women entrepreneurs doing big things. So I decided to let my guard down and just be vulnerable and just talk to them. Ask them about their children, ask them about their business. And as soon as they realized that I was going to speak to them like a human being, not a Pakistani woman, with all the stereotypes that come along with that sometimes in society, they were vulnerable. And we connected on a level that we're sisters for life. And we bonded on, of course, shoes, good-looking men, Brad Pitt, maybe one of them. That transcends any culture. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce you to my dear friend, Maria. She is in Pakistan. And when she arrived to the school, she is a firecracker. But this girl, she said to me, she said, Amy, I don't ever understand when people come to a place like this and they 
they close up and they go into their shell and they're afraid that if they just reach out that they are going to somehow leave the door open for someone to insult their religion or they don't trust that the other person is going to respect their culture. She said, I would assume that if I were to show you respect, you would show me respect as a human. I would assume that if I were to show you love, you would show me love as a human. And a light bulb went off and I had my own human moment. That's the only way that I can describe it because my switch flipped and I knew that I would never be the same person again. I looked at these women as my sisters, we were the same, we had the same goals, we had the same quest for happiness, same quest for love, for success. And I realized as she told me that this is the first time in her entire life that the qualities about her that make her a successful entrepreneur, being tenacious, uh, having courage, being outspoken, having an opinion, those were all looked down upon at home. And she was told that she was wrong and she was um, disobeying her culture. And so for the first time in her entire life, she felt that she was being appreciated and celebrated just for being who she was. And I realized that this is in a really important place that I was in. I'd like to introduce you to Madame Solomon. And we call her Madame because she likes to tell everyone that she's 100 years old. She's not, but I'll give it to her if she wants to be 100. So Madame is from Haiti, and she was here um, in the States for the same, similar business training program. Madame is a nurse, and when she arrived to campus, she was studied by a cane, sometimes a wheelchair, depending how she was feeling. And she was, she was a tough nut to crack. This woman was, she was hard. She didn't want to have anything to do with me. I thought she hated me. And I was, I was used to these women being a little more friendly, and if I would reach out to them, they would reach back. But I realized that because of all of the aid and things that are happening in Haiti, they have a, they have a level of trust that they need to establish with you first. And as soon as she realized that I was not ever going to treat her like a charity case, because she's not, she is a woman entrepreneur, and we are investing in her because we believe in her, and she's worth the money, worth the investment, worth the education, her wall came down. Madame Solomon danced, country line dancing. She opened up. She, she had her moment, just like every other woman did, did while they were here. Uh, I realized that... You know, she's telling us the story about, um, she finally trusted us to tell us the story of, of her life. As I said, she's a nurse, and so in 2010, she was standing in her three-story nursing school, and she was teaching a class, and the earthquake hit. So the nursing school collapsed on her, not only burying her, but killing 100 of her students, and her son. So she came to the States with the determination to change and to rebuild. And that she did. My boyfriend went to Haiti to volunteer his time um, a couple months ago. And this is the picture of him with Madame Solomon. And she has rebuilt her school. She went from tents in the park to a building to a bigger building. And she now has 600 nursing students that she's teaching there in Port-au-Prince. We have some amazing opportunities to reach out and empower and inspire others. This is a school in Afghanistan that I went to. When I first met her, she had one room, and now she has an entire building, up to 12th grade. And they're very happy because we just fed them cookies, so. <laughs> and this doesn't just, this just does, uh, doesn't go for women, this is men too. So these men also came to the States, and I had the immense honor and privilege of calling them my friends. And they grew, and they had their moment too. So they went home, and they all own radio stations. So with the fall of the Taliban, for the first time ever, they're understanding and learning that they have free speech. How do you use that? How do you use that in a, in a, in a way that can not get you killed, number one? And number two, how do you grow that? And so they went home after their training, and they hire women. They hire women journalists. They hire women anchors on their news stations. 
They drove from hours and hours from all over Afghanistan to meet me in Kabul. And they gave me this beautiful blue scarf and the dress to go with it, but it's probably about two feet too long for me. So I chose just to wear the scarf, and they were in incredible. We had a group of women here from Afghanistan uh, in January, and my dear friend Gidi, she said to me, we were the charcoal beneath the ashes. We believed that we could burn, but you were the fan that lit our fire. What a beautiful sentiment. And when she said that to me, I thought to myself, why are we not giving the same type of attention and empowerment and inspiration to the people that are right here in our families, in our community, at our workplace? Imagine how we could grow and we could help others grow if we just gave them that simple respect of believing in them, being there to support them, and never ever telling them that because they are a woman or a man starting out in a job that they'll fail or they weren't meant to do it. To really empower other people and to see their best self, I think that we could do some pretty incredible things right here. So my challenge to you is to be that fan for someone else. Light that fire. Thank you.